Good morning. Well, this is the largest conference the Cultural Landscape Foundation has convened to date. We have about 440 people registered. And so we're happy to now concur that Toronto is, in fact, leading with landscape. Before I begin, I just want to do a couple of plugs first. We would not be here today. We wouldn't be able to do the events that we're doing without our generous sponsors. And in particular, I'd like to spotlight Great Golf, TD Bank, Polycore, the City of Toronto, and the Garfield Weston Foundation. Can I have a round of applause for them for making this possible? In addition, we've heard a lot about Michael McClellan and Janet Rosenberg. I want to thank you both. I also want to thank Nina Marie Lister and her students at Ryerson and the students from the University of Toronto who have dedicated an entire semester's work to support the guidebook and to see the public display that you'll see later in these events. This all began because I wrote a blog on the Huffington Post about two and a half, three years ago. I was drawn to come to Toronto, really out of conversations with my co-curator, Jane Amidon, um, where we were both, um, I would say, quite jealous of the work that was being built in Toronto. And so I came here to see the waterfront parks, and they did not disappoint. I'm a native New Yorker, and I grew up in New York City when Battery Park City was being built out. And not since Battery Park City had I seen a city where shoulder to shoulder, landscape architects work side by side to define the quality of the built environment to such a degree where there was a common symphonic language and there was a continuity and contiguity of the design that I had not seen. This had been taken to the next level here in Toronto. Conversely, as Michael said, we're both professed modernists and I too had seen enough in Canada to understand that modernism and the picturesque can go hand in glove, that they're not mutually exclusive, that when we look at this idea of a second wave of modernism, in fact, we can, in earlier conferences, Michael Van Valkenburg got up and said, well, we're in a third wave or a fourth wave. This is a marketing strategy, of course. But the reality is that great Olmsted landscapes have also very comfortably housed modernism in Canada. And there are examples here in Toronto as well. But the thing that started to sort of perplex me was after coming here and getting a greater depth of knowledge of the built heritage, I thought, who designed these places? How do the globally celebrated network of ravines, when they happen to sit in a work of landscape architecture that was designed by someone in the 19th century, affect, inform how we manage change? The other thing that was also happening during these visits is the idea of friends groups, bottom-up planning was taking hold. And as I looked for information on these designers that I couldn't find online, I would find mission statements, vision statements for locally based initiatives that were messy and at times confounding. All aspirationally trying to do good things, but not having what we would call a shared value system. So, when leading with landscape, the question for today is what role does authentic, extant, historic fabric play in the renewal and creation of future parks and open spaces? And as you begin to look at the legacy, and as when I came here and I walked down University Avenue, I thought, well, this is a future design competition. This is going to have the usual suspects that we see in all these competitions with the usual renderings where we annihilate the heritage. Can we aspire to do more? Now, as a person who spent 15 years in a bureaucracy at the federal government in Washington setting policy at the Historic Landscape Initiative, I understand the standard and guidelines. I can tell you these with one hand tied behind my back in the US. And here in Canada, what's interesting and exciting is that there is also an infrastructure to enable this work. If you look at expressing intellectual and cultural life, this is a thematic structure that has led to the first heritage designation in the country for a work of modernist landscape architecture at the Queen's Park Complex in 2001. And we also see the hand of the landscape architect in a variety of projects having a very comfortable, relaxed, and I think exhilarating conversation with the heritage. These designs are modernist and postmodernist in expression, and they connect us to the built environment that we move through every day in a very meaningful way. Because at the end of the day, and this has been evidenced by a recent survey by the Smithsonian, 
after several years of research that the number one thing that people want when they go to a cultural place like a Smithsonian Museum is they want to see the real thing, over 60%. We have to help them do that. And it's no surprise that when we opened our tours, the first four tours to fill up almost immediately was Fort York to see the new work, to see that excitement of how the heritage can coexist with first-rate modernist design that's program-driven. Now, I mentioned the waterfront, and here we are, unfortunately not with Marlon Brando, but I wanted to sort of put a spotlight on Waterfront Toronto's aspirational goals, because to me, this also echoes what we saw in New York City with the Battery Park City Authority. And when you go back to Battery Park City today, more than 30 years later, you see some of the best maintained public landscapes in New York City because of the infrastructure that enabled it. We too see that here with Waterfront Toronto. And indulge me when I say, look at the idea of a public advocate and a steward, and also look at how they work. They work up, they work sideways, they work down. It's happening in all directions. One only needs to look at the friends of Corktown Commons today to see when things percolate up. And also along the waterfront, and this is actually a quote by Michael Van Valkenburg, we see how the industrial heritage informs, underpins, even serves as a hinge point in the design work that we see along the waterfront. And just very quickly giving you sort of a windshield survey, this includes many of our speakers today, we even put the heritage on display, on stage for theater. Where has this been done? With the city as a backdrop, we have ever-changing landscapes, again, where modernism and the past can, in fact, coexist, even in the most unlikely spaces. But what I've come to learn is that Toronto is also a tale of two cities, where the leadership that we've seen on the waterfront hasn't entirely made its way throughout the city. That's why we're here today. Case in point, this is the oldest mapped parkland in the city, Allen Gardens. You'll notice in the top there I've inserted an image by J. Austin Floyd, someone who I'd never heard about before three months ago as someone from outside of the US. One of the themes you'll find happening over the next day is that a lot of the folks that we're gonna talk about haven't been in history books. They haven't been written about. I've always said publish or perish. If we don't write about these places, if we don't make them visible, as we've seen from Floyd's work, they will, in fact, vanish. Now, for those of you that have seen my sort of dog and pony show before, you'll know that I'm a big fan of the term plop and drop. And I show this when I ask people how we measure success. And when we have community-based planning that is driven by the local context, how do we ensure as landscape architects, as stewards, as patrons, that in fact they have the same aspirational goals for high quality design that works within this layered landscape? I had heard a rumor that the mayor had gone to Riverdale Park West as a young man, and I couldn't resist including um, sort of a living and non-living plop and drop as an example of these things that just sort of get splayed out. And the question is, would they be more meaningful if they grew from the actual cultural, environmental, and ecological narrative. Now, I had shown you Waterfront Toronto's mission statement, and now I'm showing you the mission statements for the two local organizations that deal with parks and open spaces, and I've highlighted the adjectives. Notice the action words, notice the difference between these groups, and I think to some extent that there needs to be a larger grassroots constituency that says, we too should be enabled to operate up, down, and sideways. If we're truly going to succeed, if we're truly going to build world-class parks within places that currently exist or are new, we have to aspirationally aim and be enabled to aim to the same level that the waterfront has been empowered to do. So how do we teach people how to see? Now, one of the things that I was initially bemoaning when I first started coming here and I would come to these public forums, there would be what I would call in the, the ravine mafia. That if I didn't say the word ravine every fifth word, they somehow felt like I wasn't recognizing the ravines. And to some extent, I have to say, I didn't understand the scope and magnitude on my earlier visits. And one would have to live here for many years to understand their breath and their dynamism and their significance. So one of the things that I think is interesting is, I don't know how many people here play Minecraft. Yeah, that was, I think we've got the wrong demographic for this uh, question. <laughs> but nevertheless, if we've already got two million people playing this game every day, and if you've never done this, go into the glossary for Minecraft. It actually has a video, it's about 90 seconds, to explain what ravines are. 
and how they're used strategically in Minecraft. And we also see ravines penetrating popular culture in so many ways. So if on one hand the dilemma is to make visible the hand of the landscape architect or to make the ravines visible, we've got a good running start because there's two million people playing in them every single day, virtually. Now the other thing is that we also have the design community. You know, and Azure Magazine, of course, has um, written extensively about the waterfront parks with good reason. But the question is, how do we bring that design standard to the neighborhoods? And the other thing I just want to have a side reference to, um, I showed an image of Ken Smith in his Corbu glasses. Um, we're talking about modern design, but this is also a city quite fascinating, and this is a subject for another conference where there is also a great postmodernist heritage as well. And then finally, the preservationists. You'll notice for those that haven't met me before, I try to avoid using the P word because people will label me as one of those people that's out there with my sign. But this was actually a statement written, and, and Lee Side is in our guidebook, by the way. Um, Christopher Hume wrote an interesting piece in the last few months. He says regarding Lee Side, it's on track to become an heritage conservation district. There are three to four demolition requests weekly. Heritage activists worry, that's, again, it's the worry -um, about what will remain of the post-war enclave in three years or more. So when does a place like this reach the tipping point? When does the landscape setting, its context, become diminished when there are a sort of tipping point for teardowns? Christopher goes on to say, the state of the heritage report, which was the subject of his article, also points out that although more than 80% of Torontonians agree heritage is very important, it also suggests, quote, more city departments and councillors should be informed on what heritage is, why it matters, and how best to conserve our collective heritage. He concludes, increasingly though, it takes the form of an isolated building or singular artifact. Context has all but disappeared. I think what you'll see today is that when our speakers today speak about structures, they will be features in the landscape, that we are leading with landscape today, and that heritage is a part of this in terms of the space that is around all of these structures, which are often designated when the landscapes may not be. So how do we move away from this sort of stereotype of the preservers, the designers, the ecologists, you know them, they travel with a box turtle, and the stewards? The stewards, those people that are in the municipal position or the friends groups to actually manage change. When we're leading with landscape, we're going to be looking at urban landscape design today, city planning, academia, conservation and historic preservation, open space advocacy groups and engaged communities, and developers. And my hope is that we'll view all of these not as silos, but our speakers as silo busters. Now, a sort of a metaphor for today, I don't know how many people saw this in the paper in just the last few weeks, but it was so interesting to read about this 19th century wooden ship and then the amount of social media conversation that happened around this and what should happen with this based on this discovery. Parallel. Here's a discovery for today. Do we know that before we had Olmsted in the US, before we had Downing, who would have designed Central Park, we had a little known landscape gardener named Andre Parmentier. And Andre Parmentier came to Toronto and he laid out University Avenue. This is the same period as our lost ship. This is the same period, maybe 10 or 20 years later, when, when Dickens came, when the chestnut trees had matured, he said, it will be a handsome, spacious edifice approached by a long avenue, which is already planted and made available as a public walk. Knowing this today, having excavated this mothership, what does this mean when we manage change? How do we measure success in this second wave of modernism. And the same applies to heritage spaces from the modernist era that are also now subject of local discourse. So today what we're going to do is first address what it means for a 21st century city to be historic and modern at the same time. This is the charge for all of our speakers. Second, can the 21st century city be both regional and global? Three, can we use landscape as an engine to meet market demands while cultivating a sustainable urbanism? What new models for public-private financing and management are emerging? How are existing parks and open spaces adapted to accommodate contemporary and future needs and expectations? And finally, how do innovative landscape planning and design techniques developed in Toronto apply to other cities and vice versa?
As the mayor mentioned, we'll be having tours over the next couple of days. There'll also be a free session at City Hall on Saturday. And then finally, we're also convening a park summit in the fall that will grow out of all of this with the goal of aspirational goals to manage change in the future. For those of you that have been second wave of modernism groupies and attended Chicago in 2008 and the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2011, those conferences were by design, horizontal. This is the first conference that drills deep looking at one city, which is why about 60% of our registrants are from here and our local Torontonians. Then finally, what I'd like to do is set the stage for our speakers first by defining what I mean by the second wave of modernism and then to set the three panels that will follow. First of all, as I mentioned, our first conference was in Chicago. Um, there's Jane Amidon on the bottom left with Walter Hood, our co-curator for all three of these. And during that conference, Martha Schwartz spoke. And what she did is she nested her place in modernism through a lineage. And what I'd like to do today as a prelude is to nest Floyd, Strong, and Dunnington Grubb. Can I just have a show of hands? Before today, for the Torontonians, did you know these three people? Raise your hands. Wow, that's, that's good. So that's totally not going to be on the final. OK. Now, the other thing that's interesting to me is for me as a person from the lower 48, is when I think about modernism in Canada, I'm always thinking of Cornelia Oberlander. This was a wonderful quote that was in also a wonderful graduate thesis from Mark Afam. He notes, contemporary architects often reluctant to associate himself with a landscape architect, for he can rarely find one who will speak his language aesthetically. Our schools must start to train landscape architects who will be able to work in accordance with contemporary architectural principles and will understand the essential nature of teamwork. Astonishing, newly married Cornelia Oberlander said this more than a half century ago, actually 60 years ago. And Cornelia, of course, was part of the Denuded Nature Conference at the Museum of Modern Art, ensuring that Canada had its place in this global discourse in defining modernism. But what, what do I mean when I say modern landscape architecture? In the US, we begin with the bent axis with Fletcher Steele here in 1929 with the Camden Amphitheater. Also in the mid-60s, you see parallel trends in the US and in Canada. Lawrence Halpern publishes Cities on the West Coast, while Bob Zion, designer of Paley Park, publishes a monograph, New Parks for New York, an exhibition at the Architectural League, which launches things like movable chairs. We see the recycling of historic warehouse buildings like Girardelli with William Worcester and Halperin. And then I conclude with the Bicentennial, not because I love Lava Lamps and Lucy, but because it really is the bookend. We see the celebration of our waterfront beginning with newly designed waterfront parks by Sasaki Dawson de May, Halpern's first park over a freeway, revolutionary, Bob Zion's water 50-year floodplain design and the Cincinnati waterfront, Philip Johnson, Noguchi, they all came to the table for the bicentennial. That same year here in Canada, we see Cornelia Oberlander and Arthur Erickson collaborating on both Robeson Square and the Museum of Anthropology. And I don't have time today to go very deep into the spaces and the heritage here, but Michael Huff, Sasaki Strong, Massey College, Ontario Place, the canon of work by Johnson, uh, Sustrank, and Weinstein, City Hall, which is undergoing a great renewal right now, Floyd's work at places like the Courtyard Garden at the Sheridan, and finally, University Avenue by Dunnington Grubb. This is the tip of the iceberg, as you'll see in our new online guide. Finally, the panels. We'll begin today first looking at the history of coupled human and natural systems in Toronto. Here, this panel will look at the significant historic moments in the city's landscape chronology, reveal the nuances of context, and it will be illustrated with examples of place and features. To give you a flavor, Nina Marie Lister will set a foundation beginning with the evolution of Toronto's natural landscape, presented as a framework for the city's historical and cultural spatial patterns. Her presentation will include with reflections on the nature of the Toronto landscape challenges and ideas of identity and legibility, questioning whose nature is represented in placemaking and stewardship initiatives. She'll be followed by Brendan Stewart, who, whose, his lens will be looking at the historic landscape design uh, lineage, and he'll illustrate how, in the midst of a remarkable development, pressure and growth, a new cultural idea about Toronto as a big, messy, complex, and dynamic city is emerging. Finally, Jane Wolfe will conclude the panel 
offering a framework for looking at thinking holistically about Toronto's cultural landscapes, noting, most of these landscapes demonstrate complex relationships between the human and non-human processes that have shaped Toronto, and they all need to be understood in relation to multiple contexts, including infrastructure, cultural production, policy, politics, economics, ecology, and public education. Collectively, this panel will examine the ways in which particular cases and places offer useful stories about the relationships between cultural intentions and ecological processes in the built fabric of the city. This will then be followed by a seated conversation by the current planning director, Jen Kiesmat, and the former planning director, Paul Bedford. They'll address questions, why now? What is it about Toronto that all this activity is happening at this time? They'll look at issues of managing change and leading change with landscape, and then they'll identify those tools. This afternoon, we'll conclude with two panel discussions. The first will look at current work. This will be facilitated by Jane Amidon. Jane will probe, in Toronto, a distinctive urban evolution has been driven by cultural and natural systems that are a fusion of economic and ecological forces. In this panel, the design approaches of three firms are explored that express Toronto's unique qualities as well as introduce innovative design. A primary interest to this panel is how urban landscape design creates frameworks for and responds to change and how the act of designing urban spaces allows historical and future conditions to be both acknowledged and anticipated within contemporary landscape architecture. Claude will then delight us, I am sure, more than ever before. The public is informed, involved, committed, and vocal about their city, wanting the public realm to be a mirror of their individualities. Claude concludes his abstract by saying, the sense of entitlement means that a good enough solution isn't remotely sufficient in the making of public spaces today. Mark Ryan of Public Works notes, we often work with the link between the past and the future, using the design of a site to activate a renewed future from an existing context. And finally, Liz Silver from Michael Van Valkenburg suggests, a landscape embodies the social, political, and economic values of its inhabitants over time. By tracing a city's history, one can glean shifts in attitudes towards the purpose of the environment, socio-political divisions, and a stance on land ownership. And then finally, the closing panel, moderated by Bruce Koabara. Here, this group has decided that they will only use 10 images to make their points. Bruce sets the stage by referencing David Crombie, Toronto's, quote, tiny perfect mayor, who declared that the future of the city is in the public realm. Emerging from the recent volatility of the Ford era and entering a period of new civic leadership, there is an opportunity to reset urban thinking in the city, mobilize Crombie's vision, and leverage positive initiatives such as Waterfront Toronto to create a vibrant, social, environmental, and economically sustainable urban model. Adrian Gose, who's made it here from Rotterdam, will reveal a language for the waterfront, one that captures the spirit of Toronto and its people, noting it is public, it is diverse, and offers a multiplicity of experiences and programs. And Jeffrey Cape from Evergreen Brickworks notes, great cities emerge from the ground, but they come to life when the community is actively engaged as co-creators in that process of defining their localized identity and sense of place. The process is chaotic, and the narrative that emerges is dynamic, but when it works, it can often be beautiful. Not always, but often. Anything is better than placelessness. And finally, Thomas Woltz of Nelson Bird Woltz suggests, landscape architects have the tools to realign urban environments with their dependent systems for better quality of life and economic and environmental resilience. Using research into the physical, ecological and cultural aspects of a site, city, as supported by collaborations with allied disciplines, landscape architects can steer public and political will towards the creation of a compelling framework for action. That's our day. The day will be followed by the weekend and what's out there. We hope you will also explore and sign up for those tours that are still available if you haven't to date. Also, our online guide is now live with over 80 Toronto landscapes that can search GPS enabled by style, designer, or typology. And I leave you today with a recent piece that was written by Alex Blavojevich in The Globe and the Mail, asking, how then should such a park be treated and maintained? With some thought to its history, the same way we treat buildings we've deemed historic. Landscapes change, they have to, but we should understand what we're doing when we alter the design of a place. I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank everyone that is here today that have come as far as Alaska, the UK, and Australia, and we're ready to lead with landscape. Thank you. <laughs>